before we begin, acknowledge that we are meeting on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora, Eora Nation, the traditional owners of this land, land that was never ceded or given away, and we pay our respects to, to the elders past and present. Tonight's topic is living in a suburban coal seam gas field, the health effects on local residents, and we have two very hardworking and very inspiring campaigners to speak to us about this industry tonight that is causing so much damage. Nick Clyde works for Lock the Gate Alliance in Sydney. Nick has worked in Western Sydney to secure early closure of AGL's Camden Gas Project and he has supported communities in and around the Sydney Basin who are facing inappropriate coal mine development in Sydney's water catchment. These include Wollongong Coal's project at Russell Vale and the proposed new coal mine in the southern highland, highlands owned by the Korean company POSCO. Lock the Gate Sydney office also plays a role in supporting coal affected communities in the Hunter Valley and in working to secure broad coal and gas mining reform in, in New South Wales. In former lives, Nick worked in the New South Wales Parliament as a media advisor to Greens MP Ian Cohen and as a climate change and renewable energy policy officer for the New South Wales Government. He also worked as a senior climate change campaigner for Greenpeace. Holly, Holly Cronorn coordinates Land Water Future, a community campaign to protect our state's farmland, forests, water and communities. She works closely with communities across New South Wales, including Liverpool Plains farmers, Hunter Valley winemakers and Western Sydney families. Previously, Holly worked with the trade union United Voice as a national coordinator on fair economy campaigns. And I welcome Nick to the stand. Thank you, Jan. Um, thanks for having me at Politics in the Pub. So, good evening, everyone. I thought I'd just start um, just with a question for you guys. Um, how many people in the room have gas connected to your house? I know I do. So that's m maybe half, half of us. Um, and how many people in the audience here have children? So it's maybe half-ish, big ones or the ones that, you know. Okay, so it's, that's most of us. All right. Before I sort of kind of get going, I might just cut, throw in a couple of quotes, um, something topical. I don't know, did anyone see the article in today's Sydney Morning Herald by Elizabeth Farrelly, who I think is a, fab a fabulous writer? Did anyone manage to catch that article? Great piece in the Herald. I'm just going to share one little piece of that with you where she talks about, the, the article is called Grassroots Efforts Boost Sustainability While Big Boys Look the Other Way. So and she talks about four different groups and one of the groups she mentions is Lock the Gate Alliance. And she, she mentions uh, a family in the Darling Downs in Queensland um, who feel that they were hoodwinked into hosting coal seam gas wells on their property. And, and tonight we're going to be talking about Western Sydney and Camden, the experience of, of people living in, in gas fields in our own city. Um, but there's an enormous number of gas wells, as you, got, as, you, as you guys would already know, up in Queensland. So, and this is a, one of those families. Um, Nord and Norell Nothderft were buying in water even to bathe the children. They say the mining multinational QGC lured them into accepting fracking on their farm with the promise of unlimited water then gradually surrounded them with seven massive CSG wells, forcing them to live in the middle of an industrial gas field. Earlier this month, the Sisters of Mercy addressed the United Nations Commission on Human Rights on their behalf, citing violations relating to the right to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. Governmental failures at every level. On Tuesday, they are, uh, they're bringing a court case which commenced in the, in the state of Queensland. So that's, that's Nord and Norell in, in Queensland. And here's another quote from um, Danielle Hodges, um, who lives out in Western Sydney. He's been one of the community leaders, you know, playing a very prominent role in the campaign to try and bring uh, closure to, those, to the gas fields out in Camden. So um, Danielle at one point said, the New South Wales government acknowledged that coal seam gas doesn't belong near homes when it brought in laws to stop any new projects happening within two kilometres of residential areas. So we are asking for those laws to extend to protect our homes too. Um, so I think Danielle puts it very plainly and very simply there. Um, 
with what the community is asking out in Western Sydney. So, um, so with that, that said, um, thank you to Jan for inviting me along. Thanks for Holly to coming along as well to speak tonight. Um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm 47. I live in the inner west. I don't live in a gas field. I do have kids as well. I've got three young kids. Um, I'm, at the mo I've, I'm fortunate enough to be working with the Lock the Gate Alliance. Um, so we are very privileged to work with about 260 community groups around Australia at the moment who have joined the kind of umbrella that is Lock the Gate. Um, there's about, I think the latest count was about 380 communities that have declared themselves gas field free. And there's a handful of, thank you. <laughs> yeah, which is really inspiring. And it's, you know, pe ordinary people out there in their communities doing the hard work, um, declaring themselves gas field free. And that's really having an impact. Uh, you know, I'm sure Holly's gonna mention Gloucester when, sh when she speaks later on tonight. Anyway, so you guys, I, I imagine, would be broadly familiar with the work that Lock the Gate does. So let's move on then. The, the title of tonight's talk is Life in a Suburban Coal Seam Gas Field, The Health Effect on Local Residents. Um, I'm not an expert on health, I'm not a health professional, um, but I do speak as someone who has done some work with the community in Western Sydney. Uh, my colleague that Jan mentioned, Dan, has done a huge amount of work in Western Sydney. Um, I have also done a little bit of work with Lock the Gate, uh, developing a paper on the health impacts of coal seam gas as part of our national work to try and, you know, uh, we reform that industry and protect people from, from the worst impacts of gas. So Camden, it's the only commercial gas field operating in a, uh, operating a, a commercial coal seam gas field operating in a residential area that I'm aware of in Australia, um, an urban residential area. Um, as I said, it's been going since 2001. It's about 144 wells that have been drilled out there. The majority of those wells have been fracked. Um, we don't know, even though the government has been insisting that chemicals uh, need to be disclosed by the company, by AGL, since 2012. We don't know what chemicals were used before 2012. As the National Toxics Network point out, um, we don't, no one understands the impact of that cocktail of chemicals um, on, on the human body. We also know that the, the, ma the majority of wells, thanks fella. Um, we know that the majority of the wells that have been fracked out there at Camden in Western Sydney are within two kilometres of homes, schools and businesses. Um, we also know that after enormous pressure from the community and from organisations like Landwater Future and Lock the Gate and the Western Sydney Stop CSG groups, um, that AGL have announced that they will close the Camden gas field earlier than they'd intended. Um, and that, that at the moment their timeline is 2023. Um, so they've brought it forward but there's still another eight years of production and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, we also know that there's a, a lot of people living out there, in a, it's, it, it's a, a part of Sydney where that's developing very rapidly where there are all kinds of housing estates and urban developments um, proceeding and planned and that a lot of people that bought land out there didn't had no idea that they were living in a gas field or that they were about to live in a gas field or even you know some of the homes there are 75 meters away from a producing gas well right now um, we also know that there have been all kinds of problems out there there have been leaks uh, the EPA has had to intervene on many occasions some of those leaks have been quite major in scale um, and I'll come back to that also in a tick so, but for, before I come to uh, the direct experience of the community out there, I'll just share a, a brief snapshot in terms of where the evidence is at in regards to human health and unconventional gas. It's often called unconventional gas in Australia, and that, that kind of covers shale gas, um, tight sands, and coal seam gas. Um, as opposed to conventional gas, which is kind of, you know, the regular gas that pools in, in big underground reservoirs and they just drill one or two or maybe three wells and they get a huge volume of gas out. But with coal seam gas, they've got to drill multiple wells, they've got to keep drilling. And now, of course, they're also drilling horizontally underground, including underneath people's homes at Camden. And that's another issue. Um, there is uh, some of the local residents out there reporting that the, the walls in their homes are cracking 
as those as that uh, drill proceeds underneath uh, through the coal seam uh, underneath their homes. But um, in terms of the short term impacts, um, the, I think the research draws a distinction between the acute immediate impacts that can occur if you're exposed to uh, air pollution from gas. And that's mainly what I'm going to talk about. I, you know, if uh, there's a lot of impacts from unconventional gas on health, there's a lot of exposure pathways to the human body, there's soil, there's water, there's air, fracking chemicals, drilling chemicals, drilling muds. Um, the fugitive emissions through soil and through the wellheads. There's, there's plenty of opportunities for nasties and toxic materials that are in the gas or in the chemicals that are used to, to get to extract that gas um, to find their way into the human body. But primi primarily for the Camden community, uh, given that those fields are established, that they're now operating, I'm going to talk about, focus my talk on the air pollution primarily. So what do we know about the short-term impacts of air pollution in a gas field? Well, what we know is that the community in Camden, and indeed communities in the United States who live in shale gas fields, um, report common symptoms. And they're things like upper respiratory tract problems, so you know, breathing difficulties, burning eyes, headaches, vomiting, um, rashes, nosebleeds, that kind of thing. And there are a lot of people who've come to Lock the Gate who Dan, my colleague, has developed relationships with um, who, in whose homes he has sat and heard stories of affected residents out there who report these kinds of symptoms. Um, so they are very concerning. You can imagine as a parent, if your child is getting nosebleeds on a regular basis, if they're getting headaches, if they're getting rashes, um, that is very concerning as a, as a parent uh, and as a child to, experiencing those symptoms. Um, and these are symptoms that are going on and on and on. So this is what people are living with out there in Western Sydney. Um, perhaps even more concerning though, um, or equally concerning, I, I was quite alarmed by this the more that I looked at the literature. And, and bear in mind that um, this is a rapidly growing uh, area of scientific and health inquiry, the impacts of unconventional gas. Um, because there are the, our industry is quite young in Australia, um, it has been going for a while in Camden, but in the Queensland community, <coughs> excuse me, you know, it's, it's a relatively young industry. And um, in the United States, it's a massive industry and it's been around for slightly longer. So there's, there's a, a little bit, uh, there's more resources, there's more data, there are more studies emerging out of the United States. And what we know about those studies um, was summarised by the Medical Journal of Australia when they, they published a piece in October of last year. And what they characterised, all of this emerging research out of the United States, um, the, the quote that I pulled for you guys was, the limited evidence from the US should serve as a warning to those intent on expanding gas extraction in the absence of epidemiological studies. Um, the reason why they made that statement is because the, um, the more peer-reviewed scientific studies that, that, we are, that are being published, the more problems that we're finding exist or possibly exist in these fields. Um, we also know from these studies and from the work in the US and the work in Australia that there, there simply are no long-term epidemiological studies of the impacts on the human body of unconventional or coal seam gas in Australia. They don't exist, those studies. Um, so if you're someone who's living out there in a gas field, uh, that's not very reassuring. Um, the review of the evidence, um, there was one done in Queensland last year by uh, a, a highly regarded academic, Angela Werner, um, uh, saying that um, the, some long-term health impacts such as cancer, endocrine disrupt, disruption, um, and developmental nervous system and reproductive effects may not present for years due to their longer latency periods. Um, so this is a huge concern. And there's a lot of data, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of data, a lot of facts, a lot of figures. Um, there's plenty of research papers. Um, 
if you're interested, I can uh, connect you up with some of those studies after the talk tonight. What I thought would be more useful for you guys tonight, rather than um, going into the world of facts and figures and quoting peer-reviewed studies, I thought I'd just share with you what a, a few of the health professionals, people that, we, that are respected in the community are saying about unconventional gas in Australia. So I've got three or four of those. I'll start with the Acting Chief Health Officer of Victoria. They've just had a parliamentary inquiry at the end of last year in Victoria. Um, Professor Ackland stated that the sort of health effects that can occur as a result of exposure to chemicals associated with unconventional gas include effects on the immune system, the nervous system, liver and kidney toxicity, reproductive issues, cancers, respiratory and cardiovascular illnesses and psychological effects. Professor Ackland told the Victorian Parliamentary Inquiry that, quote, the full range of hazards posed by the industry is currently unknown, and that for the known hazards, the scientific data is limited. The Australian Medical Association um, have called, have passed a motion calling on Australian governments um, to ensure that coal seam gas operations are subject to rigorous and independent health risk assessments before they are allowed to proceed. Um, and they're really lobbying hard for the precautionary principle to apply, so let's not develop this resource if we can't be sure what the impacts are on the human body. Doctors for the Environment are calling a, on for a complete moratorium on unconventional gas until the health and environmental consequences are adequately understood. Um, the National Toxics Network, um, and there uh, is a fantastic organisation, they've got a great study if you want to download that, that's up on their website now. Um, on the impacts of, well, they actually go into a lot of detail characterising the chemicals used in fracking and unconventional gas. And Dr. Marion Lloyd Smith, uh, who's, who's an amazing woman, she visited the community in Western Sydney very recently to share her research and to answer questions from, from locals. Uh, we met in a church hall out there in Camden. And what Marion had to say to that local community, this was about uh, six weeks ago, I think, um, wasn't very reassuring for local people. Um, they, there was, you know, some excitement in the room. People were, the, the news that AGL was going to close their Camden gas field was, had only just happened a week or, or so earlier. So people were excited about that. Um, the community was, 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 uh, had written to the chief executive of AGL, Andy VC being very reasonable, suggesting that, uh, okay, well, that's great that you've announced that you're going to close the gas field in 2023, but we're being told by all of these health organisations, by health professionals, that there are all these problems and that we, you know, th that we know that there is a bunch of problems and there's a whole bunch of other health academics who are saying there's plenty more problems in the pipeline, or we think there are, once we get the research done and once we've got space to do those epidemiological studies. Um, and bearing in mind that some of those studies too are really pointing towards impacts on small children in particular um, and the un unborn kids too, um, so which is particularly concerning in a high growth area with a lot of young mums. Um, so the, the message that Marion had for the community uh, in terms of well, how close is too close, you know, how close is dangerous, how, you know, what should, how worried should I be if I've got a family? Uh, and there were some families out there. There was a gentleman called Pierre who got up and spoke. He's got three young kids. And he got quite emotional, to be honest. It was, um, you know, the, the very real emotional toll that is, um, that is being, uh, happening to people out there who are worried, worried for their futures, who look at what um, the New South Wales government is telling them about gas. Uh, they were spruiking, you know, a shortage of gas at one point in New South Wales. Now we know that at the end of the last year, um, Anthony Roberts, the Minister for Resources and Energy, put out a press release saying, oh, well, actually, we've just doubled our capacity from Moomba in South Australia into New South Wales. So we think we can supply about twice as much gas as we currently have access to um, from the Eastern States pipeline. So, and bearing in mind that uh, Camden only supplies 5% of New South Wales' gas needs, that they're going to shut the field anyway, they've already announced that. So the community's thinking, well, hang on, you're going to close the field anyway, it's a small gas field relative to the demand from New South Wales, and we're learning more and more and more about how dangerous unconventional gas is on our health. So maybe you should just close this gas field now. 
Um, and that was a, a call that was very strongly supported by Dr. Marion Lloyd-Smith from the Toxic, National Toxics Network. So she was saying, as a chemical expert, as someone who's worked in the field for decades, as someone who's written a report at the end of last year, drilling all in, you know, uh, unpacking all of the chemicals, soon as possible. Um, I think that's a very reasonable call. And to that end, um, I would encourage you guys to join your local group if you're not already a member, um, support the work of Stop CSG Sydney or Stop um, CSG out in Western Sydney. Um, we have a petition. I'd like you to invite you to sign that. I might circulate it in a moment. That's for the National Health and Medical Research Council to fund an urgent and proper study of the impacts of unconventional gas on human health and to provide immediate guidance to state governments about the risks. So that's just one thing that we're doing. There's also a national inquiry, Holly might mention it, um, the Lazarus inquiry that's touring around Australia at the moment. So there's some opportunities there, but I won't say any more. I will pass over to Holly Crenon. Thank you. Thanks, Nick.